Grandstand on BBC One at the moment offers racing, followed by ice hockey, athletics and, of course, final score. Here on BBC Two in 25 minutes, the first of our double bill of films from the Powell Pressburger partnership, Ill Met by Moonlight. First on two, Look Stranger follows an unusual commuter journey to the 15th century home of Andrew Campbell. that this old line was built all those years ago just to carry slates from Blinefus Tineog down to Port Medic. From Port Medic they went all over the world. Nowadays, of course, people travel on the Fustiniog Railway so little pleasure. But the Fustiniog Railway isn't just a source of pleasure for me, it's my lifeline. This is the start, I suppose, of my greatest blessing, my journey home, probably one of the strangest commuter journeys that any commuter has ever undertaken. Before I let you into my secret, I feel perhaps I ought to try and explain why somebody like myself of Scottish origin came here at all. Most of my time in the army has been spent abroad. The trouble was that being so continuously overseas, I began to feel a, almost a foreigner, as though I'd been exiled from the United Kingdom. And after I discovered North Wales, the urge to get away from the scene abroad got almost irresistible. The difficulty about setting up a permanent home in Scotland was that as a solicitor of the Supreme Court of Judicature in England and Wales only, I couldn't practice in Scotland. So if I needed to earn a living, I'd got to do it either in England and Wales. Now, that being the case, Wales really was the only choice. And the way I've done it is to get myself employed by the Mary Honest County Council as a solicitor. This is the Vale of Fustiniog. And if you look now across it, you'll see my house just showing within the trees. As soon as I saw it, I fell in love with it, but it didn't occur to me at that time that I should ever be the owner of it. I don't know why I'm looking at the clocks. They only give the times of the trains anyway, and there are no trains in the winter. I'm not in the position that the average commuter is today. I've got another means of getting up this line. Despite all the difficulties, this really is the gateway to home for me. It 
really is an engine. In fact, I, I bought two of them a long time ago, and I own this one. I actually own it. Um, I've got a sort of an arrangement with the company by which I can use their railway lines. It, in the old days, they used to have an old-fashioned arrangement called a running powers agreement. But all that sort of thing went up with nationalisation. I suppose I must be one of the last surviving people in this country, anyway, who has such an agreement with the railway. Anyway, as a result, I can drive my engine anywhere I like on their rails, provided that I don't interfere with their ordinary services. Now, I think the time has come to have another go at getting the damn thing going. So, John, can you give me a hand? Yeah, surely. OK, well, now decompress the damn thing. Yes. And if you will bring it over when I shout out, all right? Right, fair enough. Right. There goes our next door neighbour. And here's our neighbour, in every sense of the word. He helps us, we help him. All the Colonel's guests go up from here. I see the welcome that they get. Sometimes he comes down from with his train, sometimes they go on the passenger train in the summer. But always, they come back totally different people. I don't speak any Welsh. I haven't indeed got a drop of Welsh blood in me, but I seem to have been accepted by them. And of course, the plain fact is that the law is administered, even in North Wales, where 75% of the local population are Welsh speaking, is administered in English. And now we're going through Garnet Tunnel. There's been a lot of engineering difficulty, I believe, with this particular uh, tunnel because the rock over the top is not very thick and it's somewhat loose. However, let me assure you that it's reasonably safe. This is Coed de Blithiae, which is the home of Mr. and Mrs. Johnson. A quite splendid people who seem to enjoy the sort of isolated life that we do. Thanks, Andrew, very much. I was hoping you'd What's the come weather up like at Dol Gaffley? Well, all right, yes, between yes, times. Okay. They're quite safe? Yes, Jolly lovely. Good. Thanks very much, Andrew. See you again. Yes, indeed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Andrew. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. That gentleman standing beside the line there is Mr. Chris Davis, who I suppose, apart from Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, is my nearest neighbour. Morning, General! Good morning! He's a Welsh farmer and a very good friend indeed. I don't like to think too much about what he thinks of me, but we get on. There's our local herd of wild goats. They're very wild indeed, so much so that unless they're used to, you rarely see them. They're very beautiful, and it seems to me they do make it quite clear that this is wild Wales. I've got five grandchildren, and as far as I can remember, none of them have been named after me. It must be something of a come down to have to have a a railway station uh, as the only sort of memento of one's name. And that's not quite the end of the journey. I've got to put the train to bed.
Plunk, click, every trip, you might say. Uh, it looks like rain, but this coat won't be much help. It's really my number one uniform for driving engines. Here we are at home. Now, this is my machine and this is my signal box. But when I say that, what I really mean is that it's the country's machine and their signal box, but it's peculiarly for my use in connection with this platform. It's a, a, a fail-safe arrangement. There are two other machines linked to it, and when I put this staff in, as I'm going to do now, um, it has the effect of making the other two machines uh, available for use by any traffic that wants to come up. And of course, even in the winter, there are work strains and all sorts of odd movements. Uh, John Harrison sort of arranges things down in Tannerbrook. In fact, I should say he's the chap that really controls this length of the line, and um, he checks very carefully what I do, and he makes quite certain that I've done what I ought to do. I'm afraid frequently I don't do it, and of course then I get a rocket even from him. But there we are. We put up with that. I can always claim to be an amateur. He's a professional. I'm not paid to do it. He is. Before I go, I must just check the electrics. Yes, OK. A pretty strange clocking off, but it's clocking off for me. There it is, as the Alt. It's also known locally as Cromwell's house. And it was this description that so fascinated me that I felt I had to walk up here and have a look. And when I saw the house, I was completely fascinated. I, I have a feeling that um, destiny had quite a hand in my having acquired it. A series of coincidences led to, to, to my buying it. Um, I went to the auction. There wasn't any opposition to what I was bidding, even though it was modest. Um, the money was made available by my bank, which surprised me very much at the time. So many coincidences that I began to feel that perhaps it, they weren't so coincidental after all. I used to have to carry all the groceries down on my back. And then I started using a wheelbarrow as the path improved, but you can see we've now got a very much better means indeed. The hoist was actually constructed by a lunatic American that came to stay for a short while. That is my crest. I'm afraid it didn't come down in the family. I applied for a grant and I got it. A conceit, I suppose, but there we are. We all have our little conceits and that's mine. Nouveau, not so riche, I suppose you could say. When I first saw this house, I realized that it was something out of the ordinary, but I must confess I didn't then know that in fact, we had found a gem. The state of repair was, of course, deplorable. The roof was sliding off, the wet was getting in everywhere. Well, we had to set about it and did. And it was then that the true character, the historical and architectural character of the house began to reveal itself, rather like, perhaps this is a bit extravagant, but rather like uh, a, a, a diamond cutter cutting a gem. It's a rough stone to start with, and as he cuts, so the beauty emerges. In this case, I felt all the time, the more one did, the more beautiful the place became. And I'll defy anybody 
to say that it is not extremely beautiful. Now, of course, it had a family associated with it, and we did some research and discovered that it was, in fact, a very old Welsh family of the name of Lloyd that had lived here for many, many generations. There's an old book that I've got which uh, suggests that the house was built six or seven or even longer, a hundred years ago. Um, I doubt that, but it certainly was built, part of it, in 1400 and perhaps the remainder in the 16th century. I know that I came here as a stranger, but I feel I've been able to integrate, and indeed, I seem to have established a kind of etheric, if I can use that rather extravagant phrase, connection with the Lloyd family. I'm totally conscious of them, as though they themselves had been part of my own family. But maybe that's just nonsense. I don't know, but that's how I feel anyway. More important still, um, I've always been interested in material working. This is an example. This door. Now, people look at that and they say, oh, lovely, very old. Well, the oak is very old, but in fact the door isn't. I made it, completed it, perhaps is a better expression, about three or four weeks ago. Timber is very ancient oak. The lock, which is very attractive, is a very old lock that I found in the Dordogne in France when we were on holiday there. I spent a lot of my time going round old antique shops and the like, looking for bits and pieces of antiquity, which I can build into my house. champagne doesn't go very far and it's just about right for two but we're not alone here local legend is that Cromwell used to keep his prisoners here prisoners who were taken in the course of the civil wars well I have a feeling that some of those old boys sometimes come back just to see what's going on but that's just a feeling I have had an experience or experiences and so uh, have others which goes beyond just feeling. Now, you may find it difficult to believe, and I'm not pulling your legs, this is true. I've been in various rooms, and I've suddenly been conscious of a presence. Nothing I could see, but something I could smell. The smell was a marvelous scent. Sometimes it was a um, freesia or something like that, very exotic. And as rather pragmatic people, we've been forced to the conclusion that there was and is no rational explanation whatsoever for these disembodied, so to speak, scents that we've experienced over all the years we've been here at infrequent but nevertheless regular intervals. Now, that's why I say we're not alone. This isn't just playing war games on a Welsh mountainside. If something did go wrong, it could, of course, be quite serious. The fact that nothing has gone wrong over all the time that I've been trying to help the Festinior grow with this new development, I think is due entirely to what I learned during the course of my many years in the army. Having got this far, the railway's got to go through the mountain. And this is actually the approach to the tunnel that's got to be constructed. The trouble is that instead of being soft slate, as most of the mountain is around here, it's granite. So we need an awful lot of explosives, and there's been an awful lot of big bangs. It's going to help the economy of Wales, North Wales particularly, and all the people live, who live here very considerably. The more the tourists pour into the area, 
the more they're going to spend in the shops and the cafes and around the place. And it really is important. All my life, I suppose, has been, in a sense, in the public service. And this is a rather indirect sort of way of helping. But after all, well, I don't want to overstate the case, but it is a help, I think, towards the prosperity of local people. What my wife thinks about it all is rather problematical because she's always as frightened as could be when she knows I'm coming out here to let off explosives. I've never been able to persuade her that provided you don't take on your liberties, it's really a perfectly safe process. She gets really worried when there are a lot of volunteers up here with a high proportion of very pretty girls, but I'm too old to really to engage and I don't know why she gets in such a state. There are great compensations for the natural difficulties in living up here. I go out two or three times a week, down the hill with the dogs and do the shopping. Admittedly, it's a long haul uphill through the woods, but a pleasure in the countryside, whatever the weather's like. Although it seems a terribly lonely place here, I have a great many local friends who visit us from time to time. I take my sketching things out in the warmer weather and do quick watercolors. I use these when I get home, for oil paintings or slate. It may look rather austere around here, I suppose I'm used to it. But you know, it can be very severe at times. We were snowed up once for three days, but I enjoyed it. It was great fun. But you see, to me, life is rather like a balance sheet. It has debit entries and it has credit entries. If you like, the austerity are part of the debit entries. On the credit side, I think social contacts are the main entry. I do something for them at Christmas in the way of meeting the special Father Christmas train and, and, and a rather indifferent act as Father Christmas. It's all that sort of thing that really makes life up here something rather special. And above all, I suppose I feel, even though a stranger, very welcome. Of course, I only play Father Christmas in a long white beard once a year. And I don't expect the local people to be particularly impressed by that act. I think they judge me, if indeed they judge me at all, by more enduring evidence of my presence here. For instance, the reconstruction of the art and that sort of thing. I know that my recipe for happiness is not exclusive, and I don't despise the modern world. I'm not going to live exclusively in the past. The modern civilized amenities make life bearable. And as long as I can share it with others, I feel my happiness will be complete. Even though I may not be commuting in this way for very much longer. Because my working years are now drawing to an end. Lots of people accuse me of escaping when they see the sort of place in which I live. But I do assure you, I'm not here to escape. What I really feel is that this is my life's destination. And provided I can share it with others, then it's not only my destination, but it is a source of complete, and I hope, enduring happiness. Sadly, Colonel Campbell died in 1987 and Mrs. Campbell has moved from Thwalt Manor. Campbell's platform still exists, however, and a memorial has been erected at the Loop Thwalt station. The engine, the Colonel, is still in use for the Civil Engineering Department of the Festignog Railway.